I will read one verse of Scripture, and then we'll pray and get into our message <coughs> this morning. Acts 4 and verse 13. <coughs> <clears throat> Bible says, uh, you know, I, we, have, we can't start in verse 13 and not read verse 12. So um, let us read verse, um, verse 12 also. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled that they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Father, thank you so much this day for your word, which is given to us, Lord, that we might learn more about you, that we might draw closer to you, and may that be our aim through this service this morning. I pray for your Holy Spirit to calm hearts, to work through me and work in hearts of those within the sound of my voice, whether they be within this room or those that may be listening online. I pray for the filling of your Spirit to guide each and every word that I say, that again, your name and you alone would receive the glory and the praise, and the honor. And it's in the name of our uh, Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray these things. Amen. Um, <clears throat> there's two words that I want to um, talk about when we look at this verse. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, We'll talk about why I want to concentrate on those words in a, in a minute here. Uh, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. The, um, the word unlearned, um, you can kind of see two words if you, it's, uh, if you uh, look at the transliteration in English. It's ah grammatos. So ah meaning negative or no or none. Um, and grammatos, you see the word grammar in there. So literally means um, unlettered um, or illiterate. Translated unlearned. Only appears one time in all the, um, all the Bible. And then the other one, another interesting word, you can kind of see right there. Um, <coughs> it's actually pronounced idiotes, but we get our word idiot. Uh, from it, and um, um, translated here, um, it's five times translated here, um, ignorant. Other translations use different words, but those are the words behind it, um, unlearned and um, unlearned and ignorant. And <coughs> uh, the the word or the verse also says that. Um, they were called this, Peter and John were called this, by the Jews that were around. They perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, when actually, in actuality, those two, Peter and John, were two of the closest disciples that were to be Jesus, and they were with him for three and a half years of his ministry. So uh, more than made up for their lack of formal schooling, like, let's say, the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus had, being a Pharisee and, and learning the law and things like that. Uh, John and, and Peter were fishermen before they were uh, disciples and apostles of Jesus Christ. Those same two words were used <coughs> in an autobiography of a man that wrote this. He said, but I entreat those who believe in and fear God. Whoever deigns to examine or receive this document composed by the obviously unlearned sinner, blank, 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 I'll get to those in a minute, that nobody shall ever ascribe to my 
ignorance, so they use the same words there, you see unlearned and ignorance, uh, any trivial thing that I achieved or may have expounded that was pleasing to God, but accept and truly believe that it would have been the gift of God, and this is my confession before I die. Those were the la those were the last paragraph of a basically an autobiography called The Confession of... Uh oh, it's not going to fit. Uh, somehow, somehow it got squished, but it's... Um, uh, you can see at least the first word, Patrick. Uh, Patrick in Ireland, and I made the text green there for you on purpose, just like my green shirt and my green coat and my green in my tie today. But um, we're going to talk about this man, Patrick, in Ireland. Two days ago, there was a day called St. Patrick's Day. Matter of fact, I, on that day, I heard a commentary on the radio that I'm going uh, to read to you right now. I was thinking of playing it, but I thought it's complicated enough to get things going. I'm not going to try to get that as well. But um, Patrick was born in Roman Britain in the to a middle-class family in and about A.D. 390. So we're talking 1,700 years ago. When Patrick was a teenager, marauding Irish raiders attacked his home. Patrick was captured taken to Ireland, and sold to, to an Irish king who put him to work as a shepherd. In his excellent book, How the Irish Saved Civilization, Thomas Cahill describes the life Patrick lived. Cahill writes, The work of such slave shepherds was bitterly isolated, months at a time spent alone in the hills. Patrick had been raised in a Christian home, but he didn't really believe in God. But now, hungry, lonely, frightened, and bitterly cold, Patrick began seeking out a relationship with his heavenly father. As he wrote in his confessions, where I got that, um, that statement up there, I would pray constantly during the daylight hours, and the love of God surrounded me more and more, quote-unquote. Six years after his capture, God spoke to Patrick in a dream, saying, um, your hungers are rewarded. You are going home. Look, your ship is ready. I'll have more to say about that later. What a startling command. If he obeyed, Patrick would become a fugitive slave, constantly in danger of capture and punishment. But he did obey, and God protected him. The young slave walked nearly 200 miles to the Irish coast. There he boarded a waiting ship and traveled back to Britain and his family. As you might expect, Patrick was a different person now, and the restless young man could, uh, could not settle back into his old life. Eventually, pa Patrick recognized that God was calling him to enter a monastery. In time, he was ordained a priest, then a bishop. Finally, 30 years after God had led Patrick away from Ireland, he called him back to the Emerald Isle as a missionary. The Irish of the 5th century were pagan, violent, and barbaric people. Human sacrifice was commonplace. Patrick understood the danger and wrote, I am ready to be murdered, betrayed, enslaved, whatever may come my way. Cahill notes that Patrick's love for the Irish shines through his writings. He worried constantly for his people, not just for their spiritual, but for their physical welfare. <clears throat> Through Patrick, God converted thousands. Cahill writes, only this former slave had the right instincts to impart to the Irish a new, capital N, new story, one that made sense of all their old stories and brought them to a peace they had never known before. Because of Patrick, a warrior people, quote, lay down the swords of battle, flung away the knives of sacrifice, and cast away the chains of slavery. As with many Christian holidays, St. Patrick's Day has lost much of its original meaning. Meaning, instead of settling for parades, leprechauns, and wearing of the green, okay, I wore the green, we ought to recover our Christian heritage and celebrate the great evangelist uh, and teach our kids about this hero, uh, about this Christian hero. Um, so today we're going to do that. We're going to look at seven uh, characteristics of this man, Patrick, that I gleaned when I read through the, um, this uh, autobiography called The Confessions, and, um, which uh, line right up with, uh, with Scripture as well. So first of all, um, Patrick, he starts out his, uh, his writings and he says, I, Patrick a sinner. First four words. 
a most simple countryman, and least of all the faith, faithful and most contemptible to many. That reminds me of the publican in Luke chapter 18 and verse 13 who said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Or the prodigal son in Luke 15 when he, when he ran to his father and said, I have sinned. <clears throat> In his writings, we learn that Patrick lived in a Christian home. His father himself was a deacon. name was uh, Cal, uh, Calpurnius. Yet, Patrick wasn't following God. He wasn't living for God. was not even saved, as far as we know, at that time as a, as a teenager. And just because we live in a family, we live in a quote-unquote Christian family, we live maybe with siblings or parents who are saved, it does not make one saved, does not make one a Christian. Patrick confessed he did not know the true God. I think there was only one time I can recall in my life when someone said to me when I was giving them the gospel and I wanted to get past that first point which is all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And this sweet, sweet elderly lady said to me, I still remember where I was. I was, well, it doesn't matter where I was. It was in Torrington. Um, I don't know how I got, got to be witnessing to this lady. And she said, no, I don't think I've ever sinned. Um, and I thought, wow, how, how can that be? I mean, how could we, uh, where, where do I go from here? <coughs> First Timothy 1.15, Paul said, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Protos is the word there, meaning foremost. Paul described himself as the, as the foremost of sinners and you know, Patrick, the same way, he, he admitted his condition. I am a sinner. Um, and then he accepted his situation. He didn't blame it on his circumstances. He wrote this. I did not indeed know the true God, and I was taken into captivity in Ireland with many thousands of people, according to our uh, deserts, deserts. For quite drawn away from God, we did not keep his precepts, nor were we obedient to our priests, who used to remind us of our salvation. And the Lord brought down on us the fury of his being and scattered us among many nations, even to the ends of the earth, where I in my smallest am now found among foreigners. Patrick looked at himself and said, wow, I... You know, I, I, got, I got taken into slavery. It's, uh, and he saw it as maybe God's fury uh, down upon him. He said the fury of his being. But there he agreed to God's salvation. He said, and there the Lord opened my mind to an awareness of my unbelief in order that even so late I might remember my transgressions and turn away with all my heart to the Lord my God, who had regard for my insignificance and pitied my youth and ignorance and he watched over me before I knew him and before I learned sense or even distinguished between good and evil. He protected me and consoled me as a father would his son. Patrick saw that God loved him, that God protected him, that even though he had made mistakes and, and failed to trust in the living God, he knew he needed to. And there, Patrick, secondly, was saved. Patrick was saved. He said, as I just read, um, <clears throat> I might remember my transgressions and turn with all my heart to the Lord my God, <clears throat> who had regard for my insignificance. <clears throat> you know, I asked you earlier to, to smile when we sang that song, and boy, I can smile when I sing that song. My sins are all pardoned. My guilt is all gone. Glory, I'm saved. Glory, I'm saved, which is the bottom line of that, of that song, saved uh, by the blood of the crucified one. And um, Patrick was excited. Patrick got excited that he was, 
saved, and immediately he became a soul winner. Therefore, indeed, I cannot keep silent, nor would it be proper. So many favors and graces has the Lord deigned uh, uh, de to bestow on me in the land of my captivity. For after chastisement from God and recognizing him, our way to repay him is to exalt him and confess his wonders before every nation under heaven. Psalm 107, verse 2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, who hath redeemed him from the hand um, of the enemy. Later, Patrick writes, <coughs> So for that reason, one should in fact, and he starts quoting scripture, Fish well and diligently, just as the Lord foretells and teaches, saying, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, Matthew 4.19. And again through the prophets, Behold, I am sending forth many fishers and hunters, says the Lord, etc. So it, be, so it behooved us to spread our nets to a va that a vast multitude and throng might be caught for God, so there might be clergy everywhere who baptized and exhorted a needy and desirous people. Just as the Lord says in the gospel, admonishing and instructing, quote, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the end of time. And again, he says, go forth into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe shall be condemned. That's Mark 6 and verse 15. And again, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached throughout the whole world as witnesses to all nations. Then the end of the world shall come, Matthew 24 and verse 14. Last week I was, uh, when was it? Yeah, early last week. I was with my brother down in Georgia, and he was downstairs. I was upstairs uh, probably working. I was on the computer. And he was vacuuming. Vacuum was going. And I heard the doorbell ring. He didn't hear the doorbell. And the dog started barking like crazy. And what are you, what are you barking at, he says to the dogs. Turns off the vacuum, and I yell downstairs, Tim, someone's at the door. So he goes and answers the door. And I stayed upstairs. I just figured I'll let him stay at the door. And there were two, uh, turns out, Later, I found out there were two Jehovah Witnesses that had come to his door. And um, now, I don't know if how often, I didn't ask them if they come often or if somehow they found out that his wife had just passed away and they thought this might be a good time to, to uh, come to somebody because, you know, to tell them what they think it's like when somebody dies um, which was different than what he believes. He, little did they know, they came to him. And, um, and all I hear is he is just going, I hear him quoting scripture after scripture. Well, who is Jesus, he says to them. And I, again, I'm just getting bits and pieces. And listen, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And he's going on and on and giving them scripture and not letting them get a word in edgewise. And he is just giving out the gospel to them. And folks, if you want to know how to give out the gospel, just when the opportunity presents itself, boy, you be ready, and you give out the gospel. And he came back later, and, and um, he's like, yeah, they didn't, they didn't have what to say. He said, matter of fact, um, before they left, he said they both gave me a hug because they found out his wife had just passed away. And I think he had endeared them to his beliefs rather than the other way around. So I thought that was pretty... Um, uh, pretty neat when he was able to give the gospel out to uh, to them. But, you know, one reason he was able to do that is because, as like Patrick, um, he was a, a student. I couldn't figure out the S word to use here, so I used to him, student or scholar, meaning, meaning a student of Scripture, a student of Scripture. Here's what Patrick wrote. Uh, For there is no other God, nor ever was before, nor shall be hereafter, but God the Father, unbegotten and without beginning, in whom all things began, whose are all things, and we have been taught, and his Son Jesus Christ, who manifestly always existed with the Father before the beginning of time, uh, in the Spirit, with the Father, indescribably begotten before all things, and all things... Uh, 
and all things visible and invisible were made by him. He was not man, or he was not made man, uh, conquered death, and was, I'm sorry, he was made man, conquered death, and was received into heaven to the Father, who gave him all power over every name in heaven and in earth and in hell, so that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and God. Boy, how's that for a description of God? And um, um, Don mentioned that in Sunday school we're learning about the names of the Lord. And boy, there's a mouthful about about just who God is. And if you um, uh, want to get a good, good study into that, you come to Sunday school where we're learning just about who the Lord is. Mike's teaching a great, uh, a great series, 9 o'clock every Sunday. But um, when I was in, <coughs> when I actually took a, a class in Bible school many, many years ago called hermeneutics. Hermeneutics teaches you how to preach, um, how to put together a message, and then we would have to preach a message before the class, and the class would judge us on it. They would, you know, uh, write down pluses and minuses, and we'd talk about it. And I remember I would try to put an illustration in here or there. And I still remember from way back then this one guy, I was married at the time, had kids, and he was not. And he said, you know, the guys that are married, they always have great illustrations uh, because of something their kids did. Uh, well, now I have grandkids, and they just keep coming. Last night, my almost seven-year-old granddaughter Grace says to me, uh, I, had a, I was babysitting also, so I'm putting them to bed, and she comes up with the, cr with the questions. She says, <coughs> um, she said, every question has an answer, right, Grandpa? And I said, yes, but you or I may not know that answer. She said, well, Mom said when I asked her who made God, she said, nobody, God has always existed. And I said, uh, how can that be? And she said, well, some questions we just can't answer. That's how she got off on that question about. Then she says to me, do you think when we get to heaven, we can ask God and he can answer that for us? And I said, yeah, that seems right. And then she says this. She said, well, since God can hear us right now, and because he's everywhere, he knows we have this question, so even if we forget about asking him, he'll remember anyways. I mean, how's that for the six-year-old version of omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience, and God's eternality in one short conversation? I mean, it was like, you know, when I read this paragraph about St. Patrick, um, what he said, I just thought about, about that conversation that I had just last night. So, um, so, so he was a, um, a student, a scholar. He knew the scripture, and he knew what scripture meant. And folks, you know, teaching kids from the youngest age who God is and, and that he created everything. You know, this morning, I don't know, she was talking about days of creation. She had another question about that. And always, always, always asking questions. And boy, you need to know your scripture to be able to have answers. Um, Patrick, next was a uh, seeker. What do I mean, seeker? He was looking. He was looking for, let's turn to, uh, I haven't turned to much scripture this morning other than Acts. Turn to 1 Thessalonians <coughs> and chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians and chapter 4. While well, you're turning there, and I'm turning there, the... Um, This paragraph from his writing said this, and we look, Patrick said this, and we look to his imminent coming again, the judge of the living and the dead who will render to each according to his deeds. Even back then, even back 1,700 years ago, <coughs> Christians were looking for Jesus to come again. You know, we sang that song one day. One day he's coming, O glorious day. 1 Thessalonians 4 said, I would not have you to be ignorant. There's that word ignorant again. Don't be ignorant about this. Brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. 
verse 14, I'm in 1 Thessalonians 4, if you didn't get that. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. Verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We look for that rapture. Okay, yeah, the word rapture isn't here, but it's that word. It means caught up. We're going to be caught up together, raptured out of here. Um, when the Lord comes down, he's going to come in the clouds, and those who believe, those who trust God are going to go with him. And if you study scripture, the Bible says that may happen at any moment. There does not need to be a sign. There does not need to be something to happen. Oh, sure, things are going to happen after that. There may be signs of things that are going to happen after that. Um, a lot of things are going to happen after that. We're not going to get into a study of, of last things right here, but the point is, he is going to become. He is going to come soon. Uh, I'm sorry. He is going to come imminently, which may not be soon. There is a song we sing. I don't know if we have it in our hymn. No, he's coming soon. Um, maybe it's not a hymn. I don't know. He's coming soon, and there's no doubt. Uh, anybody know the rest of the words of that? He's coming soon, and there's no doubt. Da 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 da. This world with a shout. I'm going to leave this world with a shout. I don't know. Anybody know that one? Where's Laura? Laura, you know that one? All right. I'll have to get that. Anyway, um, um, the hymn we sang, 170. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glory will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved ones, bringing glorious Savior, this Jesus um, is mine. One day he's coming. Oh, glorious day. So Patrick was a seeker. He was looking um for the lord to come which probably made him whoops which probably made him a shouter verse number um or or point number six he said i am then <coughs> first of all an exile evidently unlearned one who is not able to see into the future but i know for certain that before i was humbled i was like a stone lying deep in my mire that is mighty, uh, uh, and he that is mighty came and in his mercy raised me up. Let me just stop there. So I believe Patrick here is talking about his salvation. He was like a stone, right? Dead, lifeless, couldn't do it in, in the Maya, couldn't do a thing. And by the way, that's how we are before we're saved. We cannot save ourselves. But what happened? The Bible says, um, and he that is mighty came and in his mercy raised me up. You know, God, when he saves us, he, he's being merciful to us. We do not deserve that salvation. Indeed, lifted me up on high and placed me on top of the wall. And from there, I ought to shout out in gratitude to the Lord for his great favors in this world and forever that the mind of man cannot measure. Folks, we, are to, we ought to be a thankful 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 people <clears throat> psalm 100 says make a joyful noise unto the lord all ye land psalm 32 verse 11 be glad in the lord and rejoice ye righteous and shout for joy psalm 35 and verse 27 let them shout for joy and be glad that favor uh, my righteous cause you know he said i should shout in gratitude to the lord psalm 47 and verse one, oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. God has gone up with a shout, and the Lord with the sound of the trumpet. Um, I can go on and on. How about one from Isaiah? Isaiah 12, and verse 6. Cry out and shout, O inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. <clears throat> you know, we could shout for a lot of things in life. We could shout when our baseball team or basketball team or hockey team scores a goal or when our race car driver wins a race or when uh, even when our child does well in a in a event but boy 
How about if we shout for the Lord? Because he saved us. And then Patrick was a, I had to find an S word to talk about prayer. So when we, when we give our supplications to God, we are supplicators. I don't know if I made up the word or not. But um, he said this, but after I reached Ireland, I used to pasture the flock each day and I used to pray many times a day. More and more did the love of God and my fear of him and faith increase and my spirit was moved so that in a day, from, so that I said, uh, so in a day I said from one up to a hundred prayers. A hundred prayers a day. And in the night, wait a minute, that's just daytime. And in the night, a like number. Besides, I used to stay out in the forest and on the mountains and I would wake up before daylight to pray in the snow and the icy coldness and rain and I used to feel neither ill nor slothfulness because as I now see the spirit was burning in me at that time. Paul said in Ephesians after that um, great passage about the armor of God, he said in Ephesians 6, 19, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication. There's the word supplication for all saints. Then Paul said in for me. So Paul asked them to be praying always and then to pray for him. First Timothy uh, two and verse one, I exhort therefore that first of all, first of all, prayers, supplications, intercessions and giving of thanks be made. For all men, of course, we know First Thessalonians five seventeen, three simple words. Say it with me: Pray without ceasing. <laughs> Listen to this amazing prayer um, of Patrick. Remember, he had escaped as a slave, and he walked two hundred miles. Now I'm thinking to myself, how does he know there's going to be a ship there? I mean, he, he saw some vision that that was going to happen, but I, I don't know which, to, which was the right way to go to get to that ship. <clears throat> well, I read into his writing, and here's what happened. Amazing. Ready for this? He said, on the same day that I arrived, the ship was setting out from the place. There it is. ship was going just as I arrived, just as God said it would. Wait a minute. <clears throat> and I said that I had the wherewithal to sail with them and the steersman was displeased and replied in anger so basically he said god told me to get on the ship right i have the wherewithal i'm gonna go get in the ship the guy in charge said oh no you're not by no means attempt to go with us hearing this i left them to go to the hut where i was staying and on the way i began to pray and before the prayer was finished, boy, that sounds like a Bible account to me. And before the prayer was finished, I heard one of them shouting loudly after me. It's amazing. He just starts praying after he's rejected from going on this ship. One of them shouting loudly after me, come quickly because the men are calling you. And immediately I went back to them and they started to say to me, come because we are admitting you out of good faith. Make friendship with us in any way you wish. Um, and then it goes on to say that he had hopes that he would bring some of those barbarous men to faith in Jesus Christ, and he continued with them as they went forth to sea, witnessing to them on the ship again, um, trying to do that. So he was a, um, he was a supplicator. Eight days ago, I was in Georgia for the celebration of life, not necessarily memorial service, although we could have called it that as well, but the celebration of life of my sister-in-law, who lived but 67 years, was a Christian, and my brother had asked me to say some words on her behalf, so some of you this might be a repeat for you because you may have saw online. But I was 
actually, while I was down in Georgia for two and a half weeks, I started to work on my message for today, which actually didn't quite come to fruition. So we're going to preach that one next week. But then I said, oh, I got to start getting ready for what I'm going to say at this celebration of life. So I'm sitting in a chair uh, where I had kind of set up a, my office when I was doing, doing remote work. And every day I would look at this wall. There, there was this wallpapered wall with all different colors on the wall, post-it notes. And uh, it, went, it went on and on. Uh, this is just part of it. It went on and on. And there were more of it. And it just went on and on and on and on, all these post-it notes on the wall. And I said to my brother, I said, was that P Pat's, Pat was my sister-in-law, I said, was that Pat's prayer wall? He said, oh, yeah. I mean, there was just lists of people on Post-it notes, and she'd stick it on the wall and listen. And I can imagine her just sitting there praying, you know, starting out with the Lord and praying, and just looking at that wall and listing those names one after another. I can barely read them from here, but, you know, Janet and Myra and... Jennifer and Kathy and Keith and Andre and Ethel and on this one there are others there are bigger ones those that's her family Tim and Capri that's his her son and uh, daughter-in-law and Jen and Jared and I and I just started at the so I use this as a example of who my sister-in-law was a person of prayer purposely mentioning some names of folks that I knew weren't saved that were sitting out there in the audience so they knew, yeah, this lady who prayed for you and prayed for you probably every day. And it was just such a testimony to me. Matter of fact, some folks that stood up later and gave testimony, they were almost in tears thinking, wow, I made it to her prayer wall. And um, because I just randomly listed names of, um, of them. But Paul... Or, or, but Patrick was a sub. He he brought supplications to the Lord, as we should also. So I'll just back up to the to the seven things. Patrick was a. I said Paul. Patrick was a. A sinner. He knew he was. Knew he had to be saved. Accepted his condition. Agreed to God's salvation, and he was gloriously saved. And this morning, if you have never taken time in your life to realize that. You are a sinner, separated from God, unable, unmerited, unworthy to reach heaven's shores in your condition. And that what you need to do, as John said, uh, I mean, excuse me, as, uh, yeah, as John wrote in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Put your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. God will save you as he saved Patrick, who was also a soul winner. He believed in giving that gospel out to others. He was a scholar of God's word. He studied. He knew God's word. He was a, and that's amazing, because back then, the word of God was not as prevalent, right? I mean, I have it here on my iPad. I have it here in front of me. I have it on my phone. Um, so many places we have it. Uh, he was a seeker. He knew he was looking for the, for the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was a shouter. He was excited. And he was indeed a man of prayer. I'm going to finish with one more quote from Patrick's writings. And we'll close this morning. <clears throat> he said, therefore be amazed, you great and small who fear God, you men of God, eloquent listeners, listen and contemplate. Who was it? Uh, who, who, who was it summoned me, a fool, from the midst of those who appear wise and learned in the law and powerful in rhetoric and all things? Me, truly wretched in this world, he inspired before others, that I could be, if I would, such an one who, with fear and reverence and faithfully, without complaint, would come to the people whom I love, or whom the love of Christ brought me and gave me in my lifetime, if I should be worthy to serve him truly and with humility.
you know, Patrick did return to the people whom the love of Christ brought him to, that he could do what? Tell the story of Christ and of his great love. We're going to close in a moment by singing 296. We have a story to tell to the nations. Let's just first have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to look <coughs> into the life of this amazing Christian, Patrick, just an ordinary fellow, just a person who saw himself as a sinner saved by grace. And Lord, may we have that same thought about ourselves that, as Patrick said, truly wretched in this world, but he inspired before others that I could be, if I would, such an one who with fear and reverence and faithfully, without complaint, would serve God. And Lord, help us just to have that attitude of service toward you as we leave this place today. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.